Will you pray with me? Gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. When that strange star rose in the east, the Magi didn't miss it. They had eyes to see such things. You see, while our tradition, especially our musical tradition, has called them kings, these stargazers were not political rulers. They were astronomers, ancient scientists who looked to the heavens for signs of change. Night after night, they would scan the dark sky, charting the movement of the constellations, making predictions, noticing novelties, and advising their own kings on just what it might mean. So when that unexpected star appeared on the horizon, glowing huge and bright, they knew something was happening. In their mind, such a star could only mark the arrival of something or someone earth-changing, history-making. They would have seen it as an epiphany, a revelation of God breaking into our human story. And they would have known that whenever that happens, the world as we know it is going to get mighty shaken up. And that was exactly what Herod was afraid of. A shake-up of the world as he knew it. Because King Herod was that most dangerous kind of ruler. Insecure, thin-skinned, obsessed with maintaining his power and fearful of anything that threatens it. He may... Why are you, why are you laughing? <laughs> he may have seen that new sky, that new star in the night sky too, and wondered, what does this mean for me? For even though he was called king of the Jews, Herod was really the puppet of Rome. <laughs> Everything he had he owed to the empire. He, more than anyone, knew that his power was hanging by a thread. So when the Magi first pull up to the palace with their camels loaded down with royal swag, looking for a king to honor, Herod was thrilled. But when he realizes they're only there to ask for directions to find the real king, everything changes. Perhaps naively, the Magi didn't realize the firestorm they had set off. An innocent mistake, right? Who wouldn't look for a new king in a palace? And they were so close. They just missed their mark by only nine miles. Nine miles between Jerusalem and Bethlehem. But as theologian Walter Brueggemann puts it, it's a long nine miles from the powers that be, or should we say the powers that have been, to what God is doing out there on the margins. And that's what God always does, all throughout our scripture stories. Chooses the least likely people to turn the tables on power. Think Moses confronting Pharaoh, David slaying Goliath, the teenaged Mary, pregnant and unwed, becoming the mother of God. The world would have us think that the strongest and the richest and the most influential people are the ones who change the world. But God tells us differently. For God, power is never where the world thinks it is. It's found in the vulnerable, the open-hearted, the innocent. The Magi, in all their deep wisdom, knew this as well. And so when they realized they were looking for power in all the wrong places, they changed their assumptions and their directions. They stopped genuflecting to the king on his throne and instead traveled nine more miles to do a most unexpected thing, to take their precious gifts and kneel to a child. 2,019 years later, give or take, we continue to struggle with our understanding of power. As the poet Anne Reams wrote in the poem that Simona shared with us this morning, the world as we know it is still dark. It would be hopeful to think that our human need to exploit and oppress were conquered once and for all with the birth of that baby in the stable in Bethlehem. That the aha moment of God's great break-in was carried down through those wise people to us and we could now see the world through their eyes. But history and our human nature tells us otherwise. 
Our species appears to be hardwired to grab on to what we can, to be anxious and greedy, to be fearful and even contemptuous of vulnerability and innocence. Chalk it up to our lizard brains, those primal impulses that evolutionary biologists tell us have kept our species alive and on top of the food chain since we first stood upright. Those instincts have led us to always put our security first, to wage war, to hoard resources, to hold on to power at any cost. And I suppose they have served us well. We're still here. But they have also kept us stuck and frightened and small. They have kept us at a distance from the God who created us in her own image. So she chooses this dark and sacred night 2,000 years ago to break into our story, to remind us how it should be, to invite us into the kind of relationship with him that we are made for, for as people of faith, we believe that we are more than a collection of biological survival of the fittest impulses. We believe that we are made in the image of God, that we've not just been given brains and muscles, but hearts and souls that allow us to live in deep connection with one another. Those hearts and souls help us to discern where true power lies and how to live out of that kind of power. Will we work for justice or just look out for ourselves? Will we protect the vulnerable or exploit them for our own gain? Will we focus our energies on accumulating wealth or serve the needs of our neighbors? Will we be a frightened king pacing in a palace or a curious stargazer setting out to search for God in the quiet, humble places where the world says God cannot be found? Throughout our human history, when we look hard enough, we have seen the earth-shaking, history-making that comes from turning upside down the fear-based powers that be. Or should we say, powers that have been. We've seen the divine disruption that comes when we choose a different path, a radical path, placing generosity ahead of greed and sacrifice ahead of selfishness, compassion ahead of callousness. Think of the movements that have changed the world, the toppling of monarchies, the abolition of slavery, banning of child labor, the fight for women's rights to vote, the civil rights movement, the legalization of gay marriage. Each of these movements came when people were challenged to reimagine where power and grace and justice can be found. When we saw within the most vulnerable among us the humanity and dignity that comes from being made in the image of God. For us Christians, we find within Jesus, the baby born in Bethlehem, God's generosity and sacrifice and compassion embodied. In him we welcome the ultimate earth-shaking, game-changing, power-disrupting force, all in the form of a tiny refugee child who would grow up to challenge the most enduring force of human power, fear, and conquer it with love. This, nation, this week, as our nation began a new chapter with a new Congress in a new year, I was struck by this contrast between fear and love. I was quite literally moved to tears as I watched the record number of women, people of color, LGBTQ folks take the oath of office, shifting the demographic of our leadership to reflect the great diversity of our country. Muslims, Native Americans, former refugees, all people who had been deemed powerless and now they have a seat at the table. They are walking the halls of power. And when Nancy Pelosi took the gavel as Speaker of the House surrounded by those children, well, I just lost it. It was very embarrassing. <laughs> but I felt a surge of hope that I hadn't felt in a long time. Meanwhile, up the road at the White House, our president was railing about the need for a wall to protect us from those vulnerable children at the southern border. As he tried his best to stoke fear in us about the future, he was flanked by a cadre of agents in uniform, all male, all white, and all bald, I noticed, but that's of no consequence. <laughs> 
contrast between the powers that have been and the powers to come could not have been more stark and more compelling. Now, I know that no policy or politician is perfect. There are no saviors among this freshman class. And I know that governing is filled with compromises and difficult and often painful and unsatisfying choices. But I couldn't help but feel that God is doing a new thing at the margins of our country and that it's going to be earth-shaking and history-making in its own way. So we all need to be developing eyes to see it and hearts to celebrate it and hands to support it. There is hope. The Magi who traveled those nine extra miles gave the little Christ child the gifts they thought fit for a king. But that baby has given us the most enduring gift of all. He has shown us the power of a humble heart given in love. He has shown us the power of a curious mind bent on justice. He has shown us how the world can change when we choose not to worship the kind of power that barricades itself behind a fortress wall, but instead choose to seek God in the out-of-the-way places where the night is still dark. But the stars are still bright, and the world is awaiting God's dawn. As we face into whatever this new year holds for us, with angry tyrants raging and old systems shaking, may we look to the sky for signs that God is breaking in. And when we see it, may we be willing to take that new path to lead us to the unexpected place, to do what the only truly wise will dare to kneel and give our gifts to a child. May it be so. Amen. <laughs>